This morning, though, Hebrews chapter 9, beginning in the 23rd verse. And if you're able and willing to stand, would you please stand in honor of the public reading of God's word? This is what the word of the Lord says. Thus it was necessary for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these rites, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ has entered not into holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true things, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. Nor was it to offer himself repeatedly, as the high priest enters the holy places every year with blood not his own. For then he would have had to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world. But as it is, he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. This morning, I want us to talk about what Jesus will not do. Father, take your word and break it before us. Feed it to us. May it be to us the bread of life. May it nourish us, comfort us, correct us, instruct us. May it cause us to see your blessed and beloved Son, Jesus Christ, in all of his glory. May we come away understanding that Jesus will not prop up any system that leaves us feeling good about ourselves, but lost in our sin. Instead, he has come to cancel the debt that we owed. We pray it in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. You may be seated. The writer to the Hebrews for some time now has been bearing witness to the supremacy of Jesus Christ. That's why we've been saying all along throughout this journey that, if, that the book of Hebrews offers both words of warning, warning to those who are drifting away from Jesus, warning to those who think that there is some other way, warning to those who believe that they can be saved apart from his work, warning to those who think that they need not be faithful to him, but also, on the, on the back side of that, he's offering up witnesses to the supremacy of Jesus. And he's taught us that Jesus is superior to all the other messengers that God has ever sent. Because where all the other messengers that God sent were servants, Jesus is the Son of God. The writer has offered up that Jesus is the superior uh, prophet, that where Moses was this standout figure who brought God's people out of bondage to Egyptian slavery, Jesus is the superior prophet who brings God's people out of bondage to sin. The writer has taught us that Jesus is superior to all of the priests who ever functioned. You remember that in a long diatribe, the writer taught us that, that where all of the priests after the tribe of Levi and the house of Aaron uh, were priests according to the codified law, Jesus was like Melchizedek appointed by God himself a priest by virtue of his indestructible life. And now the writer, for some time, has been showing us that Jesus is the superior sacrifice. That where all of the confidence of God's people before him in the Old Covenant was grounded upon the blood of bulls and goats, the sacrifices that were made daily and annually in the temple and in the tabernacle, where all of the confidence for God's people was that they might be atoned for in the body uh, annually, temporarily. Now, in the New Covenant, in the Superior Covenant, God, by the work of his Son, by by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ has given the superior and final offering for his people that stands once and for all, not just to affect the body, but to also affect the soul. And not so that we might be transformed for a moment, but so that we might be transformed forever. Last week in verses 15 to 22... We saw the writer talking about God's last will and testament. 
that what happens in the work of Jesus Christ is that God's will goes into effect. That God's covenant, His testament to His people, the way that He intends to bring blessing and reward and benefit and virtue into the lives of His people is by the death of His Son. And now the writer in verses 23 to 26 is turning again to this work of Jesus Christ and comparing it to that work of the tabernacle, the work in the temple system where sacrifices were regularly offered in order to make atonement for the people. And the writer teaches us in these four verses what Jesus will not do. And if you don't catch anything else today, I want you to walk away understanding this. That what Jesus will not do in your life or in mine is prop up a system of religion or finance or politics or society. He won't prop up any system that leaves you and me feeling good about ourselves but lost in our sin. We read this morning from Matthew chapter 21, the story of the cleansing of the temple. We've read it before. We've, I've preached that passage before to you. And so maybe in your mind you have this filed away, but, but in case you missed it, let me bring it back for a moment and put this in its context. Jesus is preparing for his sacrifice to give his life upon the cross. He goes on the Sunday of triumphal entry before his passion on Good Friday and he makes this grand entrance into the city, uh, a way of fulfilling the prophecies about him riding upon a colt into the holy city and there he's heralded by the crowds. They cry out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And on that Sunday night he went into the temple and he scouted things out, preparing to come back on Monday. He goes back out to Bethany and comes back into the holy city on Monday morning and Jesus goes into the temple and he begins to turn the tables over. And we all know that scene. We probably colored a picture in uh, Sunday school growing up, a little drawing of Jesus throwing over the, 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 the money changers and, and having all of the coins scattered on the ground. And maybe like you, uh, like, like I had growing up, you remember a little scene of cages being broken open and turtle doves flying out. And, and you remember that. And, and maybe you've even had the, the friends like I do who say, you know what, every now and then we just need to turn the tables over it's okay to get righteously indignant Jesus did and sometimes in that we miss the point of it all because what Jesus was doing by going into the temple and turning the tables over and breaking open the cages of animal sellers and driving them all out of the temple complex and saying that's not what this place is about is Jesus was making a declaration about the very nature of the temple itself and what Jesus wanted you to understand, and what Jesus wants me to understand, is that that temple system is irrecoverably, irrecoverably broken. It can't be restored. It, it, it can't do the job that we think it can. It can't actually offer atonement for sin. It can't actually cause the people of God to be purified permanently. It can only affect the body. It can't transform the soul. And what Jesus was doing by driving those systems out of the temple and by turning things over is he was making a statement about what goes on in that place and saying this system is broken. I won't prop it up. I won't cause it to endure any longer. I'm not going to play party to this system that cannot do the job of saving God's people. I want you in stark contrast to understand that this that you've put your trust in, this where your hopes are centered, this system that you believe in cannot save. And by seeing that this system of laws and sacrifices and rituals cannot save, it drives you to the cross where salvation is offered. 
What the writer is saying in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 23 by showing us what Jesus will not do, that he will not deal simply with the earthly copies of heavenly, rea heavenly realities where, where he shows us that Jesus will not offer his body continually over and again, constantly, annually to atone for the sins of the people. The writer is saying to you and to me and to all who will listen that Jesus will not prop up a broken system of sacrifice, a broken system of religion that makes us feel good about ourselves but leaves us lost in our sin. I'm sure by now, for those of you who know the Lord as your own Savior, that you've come to understand there's a real cost involved in following Jesus. That when you and I claim him, confess him, profess him as our own Savior and Lord, we are saying something has changed about who we are, that we no longer belong to the world, we belong to Jesus. And if we belong to Jesus, if our identity is in him, if he is the center of our faith, if he is the hope of our lives, if we belong to Jesus by faith, then there's something different about the way we live. There's a cost involved. All of a sudden, the things that we used to tolerate, the things that we used to accept, the conversations we used to have, the, the television shows we used to watch, the books we used to read, all of a sudden, the drinks we used to take become sources of conviction, and piece by piece by piece, they have to fall. Not in one fell swoop, not, not in a moment, perhaps, but as the Spirit begins to wash us clean and to renew us in Christ and to bring conviction that we no longer belong to the world, we belong to Jesus, there is a step-by-step -step approach of conviction that comes into our life and we begin to realize that in order to follow Jesus, I have to renounce the world. In order to follow Jesus, I've got to let go of the things of this life. In order to follow Jesus, there's a cost involved. My dear friend, there are a lot of people out there who name the name of Jesus who've never counted the cost. Who don't understand that in order to follow Jesus, one must die to self and take up one's cross and follow him. And there are a lot of people out there, and maybe here in this room this morning, who when they think about Jesus, what they're really thinking about is an addition to their lives. They're thinking about someone who comes in and takes a look at things and says, I can make this a little better. I can prop that up. I can make this last a little longer. When in all reality, that's what Jesus will not do. See, my friend, Jesus isn't interested in just making a better version of you. He's not interested in shining up your financial portfolio so that you can get, a little, get along a little further in the world. Jesus isn't interested in, in causing your political candidate to curry favor with the public so that uh, you're able to endure in peace. Jesus isn't interested in, in causing you to gain standing in your community, to have the favor of the people around you so that you are the big man in your community or the big woman in your community. No, Jesus is concerned with one thing and one thing only. The thing that Jesus will do is save you to the uttermost, but what he will not do is prop up your life so that you feel good about yourself but in fact remain lost in your sin. The people to whom the writer is preaching have begun to face a real cost for following Jesus. They're facing persecution, tribulation, difficulty, hardship. Their confidence that Jesus Christ is Lord is beginning to run counter to their world. And because of the nature of 
their sacrifice and their hardship and their suffering, they are considering turning back to the ways of the world, going back to the law of Moses, seeking another system of religion, another system of sacrifice, another system where they can be right with God. And the writer comes in verses 23 to 26 to say to them, you are wanting to put your confidence in that broken system that will never offer you life, that can never cleanse your soul, that can never transform who you are and give you a new identity in God, and you're wanting to turn your back on Jesus. And I want you to understand that what Jesus has done by his sacrifice has nothing to do with with correcting your system of sacrifice. It has to do with conquering that broken system. And the only way for you to be right with a holy God through his son Jesus Christ is to let Jesus have his way in you, to remake you, to restore you, to transform you, not simply to polish you up and help you go on a little longer. My best friend uh, had to replace his air conditioning system last year. Uh, we're, we're in that place in life that, that we're beginning to face those kinds of, of responsibilities, right? You buy a house and all of a sudden it's yours and you've got the responsibility for all that maintenance. And, and uh, Joey had that happen last year. The AC was, was beginning to go out and he called the man and he had him come out and look at it. And they said, well, listen... You know, we can, we can fill it up with Freon, and it's going to leak again. Uh, we can do a few repairs here and there, and we can get you by, but what you really need is a whole new unit. And there are some of us who all we really want from Jesus is just fill us up. Just get us by. Just keep us going a little longer. And what we really need is a whole new unit, a brand new heart, a transformation of who we are. The writer talks here about the things that Jesus will not do. First of all, you see in verses 23 and 24 that Jesus will not deal with the shadow. He only deals with the reality. Look at verse 23. The writer says, Thus it was necessary for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these rites, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ has entered not into holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true things, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. The writer begins in verse 23 by telling us that there are copies of heavenly realities. When he uses that word copies, he's talking about the, the things that we see here on earth, what, what his writers would have been accustomed to seeing in Jerusalem. He's talking about the temple. He's talking about the, the temporary traveling tabernacle. He's talking about the earthly place where God dwelled with his people, where sacrifices were offered up, where the Holy of Holies was, so where the priest was able to go once a year and offer atonement for the people. And the writer says it was necessary for these copies of the heavenly realities to be purified, to be consecrated, to be sprinkled with blood. They, they had to be put into effect. He's going back there to what he's already argued in verses 15 to 22, that, that what happened when that old covenant was put into effect is that the blood of bulls and goats was shed, and Moses sprinkled the people with the blood, and he sprinkled the tabernacle with the blood as a way of purifying it, as a way of consecrating it, as a way of enacting the work that God appointed for that time in the life of his people. The writer is saying that that had to happen in order for that old system to go into effect, in order for the old covenant to, to be enacted, there had to be bloodshed and the copies of the heavenly things, the earthly tabernacle, the earthly temple had to be purified with blood. 
But the writer says that the heavenly things themselves were not enacted, they weren't consecrated, they weren't purified by the blood of bulls and goats, by earthly sacrifices, but by a better thing, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. What the writer is doing for us is he's saying that Jesus will not enter the earthly copies of the heavenly reality. That Jesus' work upon the cross has nothing to do with propping up the tabernacle or the temple system. That Jesus' work was not in order for there to be an extension of the system of daily sacrifices or annual sacrifices in behalf of the people. That Jesus doesn't deal with the shadow. Jesus deals with the reality. The shadow is the earthly tabernacle. The shadow is the temple in Jerusalem. The shadow is the place where sacrifice upon sacrifice upon sacrifice was made in behalf of the sins of the people. The reality is the presence of God in His heaven. And what Jesus deals with is the reality. See, brothers and sisters, Jesus has not come to prop up the shadow, to deal with the copy, to extend this earthly work that will never end because all it ever offers is temporary washing of the body and it can never offer permanent purification of the soul. The writer says Jesus doesn't deal with the shadow, he deals with the reality. He goes further than that, doesn't he? He says that not only will Jesus not deal with the shadow, but only the reality, he also says that Jesus will not make payments. He makes a one-time offer to cancel the debt. Look at verses 25 and 26. The writer says... Nor was it to offer himself repeatedly as the high priest enters the holy places every year with blood not his own. For then he would have had to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world. But as it is, he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. The writer says that just as Jesus will not uh, deal with the shadow, he also will not offer himself as a sacrifice over and over again. That Jesus' sacrifice is of a different nature. It's not like the sacrifices of the priests. It's not like the slaughter of bulls and goats that was made annually so that every year the high priest might go into the Holy of Holies and every year make atonement for the people. The writer is saying that Jesus isn't a part of that system. He came to conquer that system. Jesus doesn't make payments. He pays in full. We all know what it's like to make payments, don't we? Uh, We've taken out a car note or we've bought our home or uh, we've had to go deal with maybe one of the most annoying parts of modern life, the cell phone company. And they used to give you your phone for free and now you have to make payments or pay it off. And I mean, it's just ridiculous. That's a racket. They got you. We all know what it's like to have that payment come due. Some of us are old enough to remember payment books. We remember when they gave us a little, a little packet and every month we would tear off that slip and put it in the envelope and mail it in with our check. And some of us, uh, we don't live in the world of balancing a checkbook. We do everything online, make that payment. It's just easier that way. I promise it's okay, whichever camp you fall in. But we all know what it's like to make a payment. Some of us know what it's like to have that payment staring us down, wondering how in the world we're going to make it. Some of us know what it's like when we've missed a few payments and the interest has compounded. Some of us know what it's like when the interest compounds to the point we think we will never be able to pay. But I wonder how many of us know what it's like 
to pay in full. I mean, how many of us have had the joy of writing a check for our home? How, how many of us have gone to the dealership and pulled out the checkbook and written a check to cover the cost of a new vehicle? I have not personally had that privilege yet in life. I hope I get there one day. But I lived vicariously four years ago through one of my church members, a little lady who is with the Lord now named Willa May. And she was a little lady. She was about four or seven and, and uh, real, real thin, and she was uh, getting close to be with the Lord. And in those last days of her life, Miss Willa May decided that she was tired of driving that old Ford Crown Victoria. She wanted a new car. So her daughter loaded her up one day and they drove the old Crown Vic down to Mobile and they went to the Ford dealership and they thought they were going to buy a Ford when Miss Willamay turned the tables and she said, I believe I would like to see a Lincoln. So they went through the parking lot and they looked at the Lincoln side of the dealership and Miss Willamay picked her out a Lincoln and and then they went to do the deal, and the man said, okay, we've got to, to run your credit. She said, oh, no, I'll be paying cash. <laughs> Later that afternoon, I got a phone call. They needed a little help because they had to bring the, the new car uh, home, and they had driven the old car there, and they also had to get it home. So they called uh, the pastor, like sometimes people do, and they said, Pastor, can you help us out? I said, well, what can I do for you? They said, can you drive us to Mobile so that we can bring the new car home? Sure. So they came back to Castleberry, and I loaded them up, and we drove to Mobile and went to the Ford Lincoln dealership, and I had the privilege of watching Miss Willamay pull out her checkbook and write that check. It was glorious. My dear friend, do you know that that's what Jesus has done for you? The writer says he doesn't make payments. He doesn't offer himself again and again and again and again. He isn't interested in propping up a broken system of sacrifice that will leave you all your life longing for the salvation of your soul and comforted only by the temporary washing of the body. Jesus pays in full. See, what he did by going to the cross is that he gave his life. All the other sacrifices that had ever been given to cover the sins of God's people were insufficient. They could not pay the debt. They left a balance owed. They were good enough to wash the body ritually, but they could not remake the soul. And what Jesus Christ did by dying upon the cross is that He, the very sinless Son of God, was the perfect sacrifice for God's people. And His blood poured out and His body broken in death was the final and full payment for the sins of the world. What Jesus did by dying upon the cross is stamp paid in full for you. And because Jesus has paid the full debt you owed because of your sin, he demands full right to your life. And mine. And the problem for most of us is that we're not interested in Jesus having full authority in our lives. We want him to be an add on, we want him to be an addition. We want to throw him into the mix of who we are so that he can make us just a little better than we were. So that we're better citizens, better church members, so that we dress or act a little better. 
We want Jesus to be just enough a part of our lives that we can say he has blessed us financially and we can do a little more. We want Jesus to be just enough a part of our lives that we have blessing as we climb the ladder in our corporate world. We want Jesus to be just enough a part of our lives that we curry his favor as we, uh, as we play political games and as we try to say that God has favored or blessed my candidate over yours. We want Jesus to be just enough a part of our lives that we we get along with all the people in our community and they respect us and look favorably upon us but most of us don't want Jesus to have full reign in us we are like the people to whom the preacher is writing satisfied for Jesus to prop up a broken system that makes us feel good about ourselves but leaves us lost in our sin. See, there's some of you who've come here today because Jesus is just in the mix in your life. And it makes you feel really good to come to church on Sunday. It makes you feel like you're a better person than otherwise you might think you are. It relieves some of the guilt that you feel for the things you've done in your life. It makes you think that if you come to church on Sunday somehow, just that little bit of Jesus you've encountered is going to make the problems you're facing this week go away. Some of us just want Jesus to prop up our broken system so that we feel better about ourselves but remain lost in our sin. And I'm here to tell you, my dear friend, that that is something that Jesus will not do. All the politicians in the world may placate you, may convince you that they're on your side, may tell you all the things you want to hear. You may have employees who are willing to be your yes man. And you may live with a spouse who constantly affirms so that you don't ever feel the weight of your own sin. All the people in your world may have you convinced that you're better than you really are, but Jesus will not be one of them. The only way that Jesus Christ will come into your life is by having the fullness of his authority and reign. The only way that Jesus will deal with your sin is to stamp it paid in full. And the only way that Jesus will receive you, my friend, into his kingdom is by the way of the cross. If you want him to just be a part of the mix, then it isn't Jesus you want and it isn't Jesus you serve. It's an idol of your own making. The world is at stake. Your soul hangs in the balance. And the difficulties and the troubles and the strife that come for following Jesus faithfully in this world are real. So real, in fact, that you may be like the people to whom the writer is preaching, saying, you know, I think I would just be better if I went another way, if I found another path, if there was some other means of salvation for me. I, I'll put my trust in another system. And the preacher declares, and I'm declaring, and God declares to you, there is no other way. Jesus will not. Prop up the systems in your life that, you make, that make you feel good about yourself but leave you lost in your sin. But my dear friend, if you would call on him today, if you would turn away from your sin, if you would decide that the ways of the world, all the systems that I've trusted in, my hope in finance, my hope in culture, my hope in employment, my hope in familial relationships, my, my hope in politics, all those hopes are dashed upon the rocks of sin. But there is a hope that abounds for me, and it is the Savior who died upon the cross and rose from the grave. My dear friend, if you would turn to him in trust this day, he would save you to the uttermost. 
Ghost. You can spend your whole life making payments, trying to deal with the effects of your sin. And you'll die and be separated from God in a place called hell. For this day you can trust that it's all been paid for you and walk in faith in the Son of God. I pray you'd do it this day.